Hello, I'm your host, Effie Pilarino, and today I have the pleasure to be with a wonderful lady from a warmer place than here in Switzerland. I have with us um, today Dr. Ira Sobel, who is in Tel Aviv. Welcome, Ira. Hi, Effie. Thank you. It's really nice to be here in Israel. I have already been vaccinated one shot, and this coming Thursday, I'm going to have the second one. I have and read that Israel is really ahead of the curve uh, yeah. in terms of uh, vaccination. So I guess you can travel while we can't. If we probably, can. I don't know if the skies will be open, but probably, yeah, we will be ahead of uh, everyone. And yeah, thank you for having me. Anyhow, I'm really happy to be here. You know, you're one of those people that um, I have not met physically <laughs> yet. Uh, and um, I wanted you to tell us a little bit about your, your uh, journey. What has brought you, you know, you're the founder of FinTech for Longevity. Um, I uh, took notice that you're involved uh, with the World Economic Forum. Uh, around the, their agenda on redesigning retirement. So we'd like to hear a lot about that. And of course, tell us about your, your previous you know, engagements. I know you, that you've been in the banking world on the board of uh, the Bank of Jerusalem. You are a, a, a business person with a PhD in social sciences. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so tell me, you know, how you came into the banking and financial world, and then a little bit more about your your more recent um, engagements. Okay. So I'm uh, basically I'm a, a CPA, an accountant by profession. So I worked for KPMG for many years until two thousand and two. And there I specialized in banking, meaning as an auditor and then as a senior auditor, we did uh, audits, due diligences, tax, business uh, models, everything to do with the banking in Israel. And KPMG in Israel is leading the uh, financial services industry. So I had the privilege to work with the biggest or the largest banks in here in Israel. And then in 2002, I uh, had my own practice. Um, I also helped startups and strategic planning and fundraising, but also I did other things like valuations and due diligences. And in 2008, I had already must also a master's in business administration from a joint program between Tel Aviv University and Northwestern University. And I went back to a uh, university to study again for another MA in gender studies. But then starting from 2008, I, well, I went back to university to study and also to pursue my PhD. But at the same time, I was in many board members as an external director or non-executive director, as they call it uh, in the States. Um, and this was also very interesting because I was both in medical devices, real estate, and also uh, Bank of Jerusalem starting from 2013 until 2019. So I have like, I think, um, an overview of many companies, traded companies, and this was very interesting. But as an external member, a board, of the, uh, board member in Bank of Jerusalem, I was exposed to open innovation and fintech. Bank of Jerusalem is a retail uh, bank here in Israel. Uh, but specializes in mortgages, but also in consumer credit. And the, um, the proposition and branding of the bank in terms of technology, innovation, advancement, and fintech was really fascinating for me. 
when I started my PhD in 2015, I did not, uh, my PhD did not deal with anything to do with fintech, but I was very much interested about household finances. And the research was how over time, what happens to households when they're uh, navigating the transitions, meaning what is the relationship with life course transitions and household wealth. And I did it for Israel and also in comparative perspectives. And we decomposed on one hand, the household wealth into real assets, consumer credit, mortgages, and on the other hand, we saw what happened over time to people when they experienced changing health and also retirement. And how does it affect their wealth, including its components over time? And one of the most striking findings was that wealth depletes over time in a very uh, high pace, especially for people from the lower ladder of income. So one of the big questions I came out from my PhD was how are we going to finance longevity? And together with FinTech, I launched the, my company today, FinTech for Longevity. So one question is how are we going to finance a longer life? And another question is, what is the role of innovation or fintech in financing longevity? Very interesting perspective. You, you came, you know, through not the typical uh, door, but really, you know, um, a very diverse uh, background and, and a long journey that brought you to um, this inquiry, I guess. And, and the passion to, to try and solve it and address it. Um, and tell me something, uh, Ira. I mean, FinTech for Longevity is a consulting company and are you mainly working with companies in Israel or, or outside? Where is your no. focus? No, not, not at the moment. Not. I tell you what, I work with banks in the UK and in the US. And probably there will be also be one in Switzerland very soon. Um, banks now, they have like three questions, I think, on their agenda. Uh, one is how to incorporate health or health data, which is becoming more uh, accessible, but also we can now anonymize health data. So how the banks, how financial institutions, we know that insurance companies have always dealt with longevity risk and longevity risk transfer in reinsurances, et cetera. So health is at the core of the insurance industry, but banking not in their probability of default models, but not elsewhere also. They up to date did not have health or health data in their financial models or risk models, not Basel II, not Basel III, probably in the future, and all these capital adequacy and risk models, nothing to do with health, yeah. probably, probably in mortgages. So people have life insurances or some certain insurance for mortgages that if somebody dies, the Mm -hmm. the, the collateral is insured. So I think now that one question is really the relationship between health and wealth, meaning how is wealth go health data is going to be taken into account, for example, in retirement planning and longevity planning? How is it going to be utilized in the risk models of probability of risk, for example, in order to... Uh, in the KYC um, um, process in order to um, uh, provide credit. So this is one question. Another question is whether financial institutions as a whole, are they really ready for the demographic trend of aging? 
what products or what modifications they have to do to their existing products in order to better engage with their existing customers who are aging or are playing the role of caregivers. For example, we hear more and more about multi-generational mortgages, multi-generational accounts. Number three, I think the question is, how are people going to protect their wealth over time and overcome periods of deaccumulation? And one of the things for, that we in my, my company is doing is we're looking for technologies in order to do partnerships with banks against scams and fraud against older uh, adults because they are very much more vulnerable to scams and fraud than uh, younger people. Now, when we say wealth protection, so first of all, I think is um, really doing everything, mitigating the risk. And here, financial services have a big role in here mitigating about plain, for example, cash flow management for an, uh, an elderly person that, uh, of course, is vulnerable uh, to, to a fraud in their day to day cash flow management. Is that what you're um, talking it, about? Yeah. It starts with the uh, robocalls. It starts, it continues with withdrawal of people with cognitive decline. Um, it's also just people, all people buy things that, that they not need because they feel very lonely and somebody's calling them and asking them to buy things that they that not, don't need and they're very, either they're expensive or sometimes they even don't receive the goods. So when I say protection, and this is a huge phenomenon in the States especially, but also in other places, and we have to remember that many of these, many of these uh, events don't even, are not even disclosed, they're not even reported. So when I say protection is not only protecting from long-term care and insurances and making sure that your asset will generate income in the future, it's first of all, uh, protecting all your people from scams and fraud and making sure that there aren't any withdrawal that are not co controlled or uh, done by the older person itself. So this is uh, a, a huge, uh, a huge issue that we are looking at, but also other products like for financing longevity, like reverse mortgages, which is coming more prevalent as, as we live, live longer. There are many people that have housing ownership, but they are housing rich and cash poor as we no as, liquidity. Yeah. No liquidity. Yeah, so I think that housing in the process of aging, housing ownership is central to financing longevity. This is among people who own a house, among people who rent a house, for example, Switzerland, where you are or in Germany, where the housing ownership is quite rare or it's less than Very 50%. Low. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then people hold more liquid assets and financial assets. So probably there, the um, financing longevity should be more of uh, annuities or other products. So housing ownership is not something very um, prevalent. It seems to um, me uh, it, that, you know, this is a huge topic because it involves a lifestyle and, and it involves a lower level practical issues, but also advice uh, because everything's connected, right? Health issues and wealth. Um, and as you, you said, this has not been traditionally a, a place that banks have played. I mean, I remember writing about two years of, of the fact that insurance companies, for example, have um, huge amounts of data that they don't really utilize and don't share with asset management that could 
you know, gain a lot of actionable insights. And similarly, you, you are talking about, you know, commercial banking and consumer banking that could develop new products and, and services. It's, it's a huge um, area. Um, how, how long has uh, FinTech for Longevity been working on these topics? I started them in the beginning of 2020, uh, directly after I defended my uh, PhD. So it's still in the initial phase, but I see that there's a lot of potential. And I see that, interestingly, it's not only financial services that we work with, is that also venture capitals that until today um, did not put aging into their uh, strategies or investment strategies. So now they want to understand more. What is the correlation between FinTech and aging? And they would like to expand their investments. And also I am involved with the healthcare uh institutions that now they would like to understand also the financial aspect of healthcare. Correct. For example, utilization of medical rights, of healthcare rights or healthcare insurance, this is very important because people, people don't necessarily use all what they are um all their provisions. So it's it's coming from financial services to understand how they can work better with health data. Mm -hmm. from VCs to better and to better or to expand their offerings or their investment strategies and from healthcare institutions who want also as a complementary aspect to see how the financial models can help the healthcare services so it's really interesting and i feel that we are really a knowledge center at the moment because we see all these players in the healthcare financial services uh, spaces. Very fascinating, Ira. If, uh, um, if uh, uh, a company, whether it is a mature company in the financial sector or in the tech sector or um, a, a startup in fintech wanted to um, uh, tap into the ecosystem that you're describing and to the knowledge hub that you're creating, how, how can they reach out to you or the knowledge hub? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, we have a website and I have an analyst working with me. So he's uh, collecting, we have, we have our value proposition at the moment is a knowledge center except me as a speaker and consultant is that we have um, since to the beginning of 2020, we have a list of 100 startups in this domain. And I distinguish them between four categories. One is protection, anti-scan and anti-fraud. Part of them are also from here from Israel from the what we call the startup nation but i have also on my list from sweden and from bahrain and from the states and from switzerland so one is protection the other is uh, managing uh, finances how to as caregivers helping parents uh, to finance their to not to only to finance it to manage the daily the finances Number three is longevity planning, retirement planning, but also end of life planning. And there's a lot of going on both in Silicon Valley in terms of uh, funding of um, digital trust, digital wills, digital vaults. So this becoming the death tech is becoming very popular now. And the fourth section is what I call financing longevity. And here we have reverse mortgages, but also long-term working. How can people, old people can continue to utilize their skills when they are, once they are also uh, retired. 
And there are also other instruments like life settlements, etc., that are forbidden in several countries and very popular in others, is that people sell their life insurances when they are alive. So they sell it to an investor through a platform. And then when the, someone dies, so the investor gets the money from the life insurance. And this is also interesting because it's part of the household longevity risk rather from the corporate longevity risk that we are more familiar with. Very Now, um, World Economic Forum that you asked me before, I think that the most, the core or the, the central or the, the mission, I think, or the objective, the major objective of the World Economic Forum is to make retirement planning, longevity planning for all. Because usually only affluent people can go to consultants and help to, you know, like a family office where you have all the time a comprehensive overview on the, uh, on, the, on everything and all your assets and liabilities. But people from the lower ladder of income, they usually don't have any accessibility to this, this advisory. And robo retirements or any digital products can really help in terms of financial inclusion also for people that are on the verge of retirement and can freely or really in a very low cost um, be provided with insights and recommendations what they have to do in order to finance their long term to do the right things for retirement And here also comes the lifetime income issue that people will be secured by lifetime income, even lower than the average, but that they would have at least the security that they have income and for the rest of their lives. Ira, thank you so much. Uh, you, you provided us with a wonderful uh, overview on a topic um, that um, I personally am not uh, that familiar with and I've been uh, listening to you with a great uh, fascination. I'd like to thank you very much uh, for all the insights uh, that you, you, you shared. And before we, we close, I want to um, bring in the perspective at a much higher level of um, the inequality of wealth that exists in the world and, and is, is rising and all the big questions of whether we will be soon forced to adapt some type of universal basic income in some form or another. It might be uh, regional, local, um, definitely, you know, digital uh, stable coins uh, are a way to deal with um, schemes like that. And it's very fascinating there how we can um, integrate all the work that you are um, uh, mentioning uh, in financial services, health uh, providers, and, and so on. Um, so on this note, I'd like to, to thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Effie, for having me. It's really nice. And uh, I also, I will continue to follow you on LinkedIn as usual with your interesting uh, content.